And thank you very much for staying up late with us here tonight. We have a 30 minute newscast on the way for you. And right now a Shelbyville man is in jail, accused of shooting and killing his wife and mother in law, telling police he had a job to kill them. Hello, everybody. I'm Doug Prophet here on the night team. The Shelby County Sheriff's Office arrested 32 year old Michael Hunt of Shelbyville. WHS 1119's Taylor Woods and photojournalist Elijah McKenzie tonight talk to neighbors who are certainly shocked about these unexpected deaths. It was it was terrible. I felt so bad for them. Last Friday, Rita Stout was at home in Pleasureville of Shelby County watching TV when her two neighbors were shot and killed across the street. I feel sorry for yeah. them. Shelby County Sheriff's Office arrested 32 year old Michael Hunt. After being questioned, he admitted to authorities he killed his wife, Emily Simmons, and mother in law, Beth Simmons. Hunt is now charged with murder and attempted murder. He told authorities he had a job to take both females out. Neighbors say they were at home at the time of the shooting, but they didn't think anything of it since the sound of gunshots is normal in a rural area. I heard the shots. There was like six bangs that went off and I thought it was the kids with the fireworks. So I got up, went to the window and I, I seen one person in the yard, but I didn't. You know, I thought it was kids. According to an arrest citation, Michael Hunt told dispatcher someone had been shot near the Baptist Church. They called and told uh, my husband that I guess he ran in the house and was crying down there and said somebody was shooting at him. Stout says he stayed at her ex-husband's house until deputies arrived. That's when Hunt finally told them two people had been shot on Pleasureville Road. The arrest citation says he had blood on his clothes. From the way that, that his friends were talking, he was really bad on like drugs and meth. Said he'd been talking like that for a couple weeks. Stout believes other family members lived in the home and were out of town when the shooting happened. I hate that he's going through that right now, all yeah. of them. Especially the boy that was out of town because in essential he lost his mother and his father. In a statement, the family wrote, We are grateful for the love and support that we have received from the community during this difficult time and ask for continued privacy. Once funeral arrangements have been made, a public service will be held to celebrate Beth and Emily. You don't never know what happens. It's 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 sad. And shocking to people here who tell us they moved from an urban area to get away from violent crime. In Shelby County, Taylor Woods, WHAS 11. 19 on your side. Family members of Emily and Beth Simmons are raising money to go towards their funeral expenses. You can find more information about the GoFundMe account on our website, whs11.com. Right now, we want you to take a good look at these photos. Louisville Metro Police say this Chevy Tahoe is connected to a shooting that happened outside a West Louisville nightclub. It left one person dead and seven others hurt over the weekend. The homicide unit released these photographs today, saying they believe the suspect drove away in the SUV after the shooting outside the H20 lounge. We know that somebody knows where this vehicle is. Uh, we are desperately trying to locate this vehicle uh, because we believe it will help lead us to identifying uh, a suspect in this case. 40 year old Joseph Bowers died in the shooting. Seven others went to the hospital, including one person with life threatening injuries. Lieutenant Les Skagg says after the shooting, the suspect drove away in that light brown or gold Chevy Tahoe dated between 2007 and 2014. Skagg says the SUV would also have bullet holes right in the front. That damage occurred at the time of the shooting and that the vehicle was possibly disabled uh, and would not have been able to travel very far uh, from the scene. Lieutenant Skaggs says anyone with information about the Tahoe or the shooting is asked to call the LMPD anonymous tip line. It's 574 LMPD. Also new right here tonight, Louisville Metro Police are crediting anonymous tips for helping them arrest an alleged dogfighter in Louisville. In a social media post, the police department says the detailed tip led them to a home on Lillian Avenue where they arrested Kareem Garner for allegedly dogfighting and animal cruelty. Investigators say Garner is well known in the region for dog fighting. They say the four dogs they found were in terrible condition, some of them sick with heartworms. They're all now at Louisville Metro Animal Services receiving care. Two drivers are dead after an early morning crash that happened on the Gene Snyder Freeway. LMPD says it happened just after 3.30 this morning on the westbound lane just past the Preston Highway exit. Officers believe a pickup truck was going the wrong way, driving east in the westbound lanes, as you can see from this Trimark photograph. That's when investigators say they hit a second pickup truck head on. The crash caused both cars to catch on fire. EMS and Okolona Fire Departments responded quickly to put out the flames, but both drivers had died at the scene. 
Well, the special judge who has made big headlines in the Jamie Knoll case will likely be removed from his civil lawsuits, according to the Indiana Attorney General's office. Judge Larry Medlock was assigned the cases when the Clark County judges recused jurisdiction. But a spokesperson for Indiana Attorney General Todd Rokita says it was only temporary. Knoll's attorneys requested a new judge last month, but we have not seen that argued in court. Rokita's spokesperson says there should be a new judge for the civil cases this week. The attorney general has filed lawsuits against the former Clark County Sheriff in an effort to recover $4 million that was allegedly illegally spent. Now, there's no indication that Judge Medlock will be removed from the separate Jamie Knoll criminal case. All right, here at 11 o'clock. Well, no, not 11 o'clock. <laughs> it's midnight. I, I'm so used to saying that. I, actually, Colleen, I wish I was saying it was 11 o'clock, but it's almost you know, midnight. Too. And it's uh, we've got lower humidity, but a toasty day on the way tomorrow. Yeah, it is going to be a hot one, but it was so nice today. We had low humidity, blue skies, a little different as we head into tomorrow. But don't worry, we have more days like today in that seven day forecast. So we have some clear skies right now. We're actually at 79 degrees starting to cool off out there overnight tonight. I think it's possible that we will get into the 60s, but your high tomorrow is 95 degrees. It is going to be a warm one, and when we factor in that humidity, I think we'll have heat index values ranging up to 100 degrees, so a little bit more uncomfortable, but this is going to be our saving grace as we head towards Thursday and Friday. This is a front that is going to push through a few scattered showers as we head through Tuesday afternoon, but the main rain is really going to be on Wednesday. I'm timing it out and also giving you your temperature forecast for the rest of the week coming up. Doug. Colleen, thank you. And all new right now on the WHS 1119, TARC riders will see changes to most of the bus routes starting this weekend. TARC announced today that 19 of those routes will be reduced and three others are being discontinued altogether. These changes are coming as the transit agency prepares to lose 20% of its operating budget. WHS 11 night teams take uh, Alex Dieterer and photojournalist Addie Hill talked with TARC leaders and drivers about how these changes will impact riders. Not enough funding. That's the bottom line that has led TARC to reduce 19 of its routes and discontinue three others. If we're looking at a deficit of operations up to $30 million over the next couple of years. Alex Pazorski, marketing and communications director for TARC, says without additional funding, the city will have to look at more reductions in the future. If we were not implementing these service reductions, if we were moving forward Forward like we had been previously, we'd be looking at somewhere around July 1, 2026, being unable to meet payroll. 22 of TARC's 30 fixed route bus lines will see an impact starting June 30th. Okay, I started with TARC in March of 2024. June 30th is also bus operator Marlon Manning's last day driving for TARC. Manning is making the transition from driving for TARC to driving for JCPS. Because obviously, you know, they've been overloaded. Uh, with trying to find drivers. The recent partnership between TARC and the school district could lease 70 TARC employees to transport kids to and from school. It is preventing some layoffs uh, for newer drivers, you know, with TARC. Uh, so the extra funding obviously uh, will keep us all uh, getting the things that we need and keeping us working as well. TARC says the route reductions gives the transit agency time to look for more long term solutions. This is probably one of the worst that it, it has ever been. Union President Lillian Brents says the route reductions will impact more than just TARC riders. It's public transportation. You cannot talk about jobs, you cannot talk about food, you cannot talk about health care without talking about transportation. Route number 40 along Taylorsville Road, which you see right here, is one of the 19 routes that's being reduced by TARC starting June 30th. And Brent says this isn't the first time that this route has seen reductions. Every time there is some funding issues, they just keep chipping away at the service um, to the point to where it's it's, it's barely in existence and as you can see it's a lot of businesses around here it's a lot of restaurants it's a lot of grocery stores it's a lot of housing around here the four most critical tarp routes 4 10 23 and 28 will remain exactly the same in louisville with photojournalist Addie hill alex dieterer the whas 11 night team on your side and now more on TARC here tonight. Tomorrow, we're expected to get an update on that driver deal from JCPS. District leaders are scheduled to give more details on how it will work at the Jefferson County School Board meeting. It starts tomorrow night at 6 p.m.
On this day two years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade and the constitutional right to abortion. In Kentucky, it automatically triggered a new law to eliminate all abortion access. In the two years since, pro-choice advocates say fewer medical students are choosing to study in Kentucky and doctors are leaving. Today, one U of L OBGYN resident said they often have to race to finish paperwork before sometimes emergency operations. Even to the point where we're having to fill this paperwork out before we're able to provide care to them, which has halted their care and definitely caused um, harm even to our patients. Saying they're concerned about the future of Kentucky's medical field, the Kentucky Reproductive Freedom Fund is launching a new statewide campaign, putting up billboards like this one across the Commonwealth. Meantime, Kentucky Right to Life calls the abortion ban a commitment to protecting pre-born Kentuckians. That is protecting lives. It's ensuring that mothers who uh, may have health care uh, issues are, we want them to be seen, you know, appropriately. But it's also protecting the lives of Kentucky's most vulnerable citizens, and that is pre-born Kentuckians. According to the Guttmacher Institute, a pro-abortion research and advocacy organization, more than 4,000 Kentucky women drove across state lines to get an abortion last year. The most common destinations were Illinois, Ohio, and Indiana.